you just need to keep going heavier. It's simple as that. And so you start hitting the bottom and then hold your rod tip up a little higher and crank a little bit faster and you'll stay just above that structure. And every once in a while you can lower your rod tip or slow down and, and feel it again in case the depth has changed. And there you go. That's all you got to do. I'm Drew Gregory and this is Hooked on Wild Waters. And we are live, Dr. Noise Water. How you doing? I'm all right, Drew. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We're uh, back at it on pace for uh, what? Every other week, couple of every two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks, we do one of these. Yeah, we, it's the goal. It's what we try it's to do. It's the goal. Every about couple weeks, hopefully, eventually sooner. But we're back at it, man. And a lot has happened since the last time we talked, which was a lengthy talk, man. Remember, we were we were going at it for a couple hours. Seems yeah, like wasn't yep. it? We were just under two hours, I think, with that with that last episode. So hopefully we didn't wear anybody is, out. Yeah, they finally finished that episode. <laughs> Take them probably two weeks <laughs> now. Exactly. Now we've got a new one here. So today's pretty cool. We're gonna, uh, as we promised in the last one, but we did not uh, fulfill that promise. We are gonna learn a little bit more in this episode. We're gonna get into some questions, some tips and tactics, but we are also gonna talk about uh, the big news that happened between our last podcast and this one, which of course was the major league fishing and FLW merger buyout, whatever you want to call it. We're just going to touch on that real quick and how that may affect the kayak fishing world. But um, before we get going on that, just want to thank all of the sponsors. I mean, seriously, they are a family that is, I always say this, that's the best word to describe them. We could not do what we do without them. We couldn't do what we do without you guys. So please uh, keep going on iTunes and giving us ratings, go on our uh, social media, follow, like, subscribe. It helps us do this uh, for you guys and for free. And we got a lot of good stuff coming out on all platforms. You know, I'm posting on uh, social media, YouTube, uh, a fair amount here lately. Ken, you got your social media out there. And uh, I know it's a little bit slower now because it's fall. We're not fishing as much, not doing as many tournaments. But if you guys can go on there and support us, um, it would really help out a lot. I'm hooked on wild waters in some places at Drew Gregory Fishing on Instagram. Ken, you are what, Lip Ripper. Say your Instagram one. Uh, lip Ripper it? underscore RVT. Yeah, I wouldn't have got that right. I yeah. can see it in my head, but I just know I would have messed it up. Yeah, that, that underscore is a little tricky. It is tricky. It is. But if anyone's uh, curious, the RVT is for registered veterinary technician. That's my professional <laughs> title, I guess. Wow. See, I never knew that. Yeah. I, did, I was always wondering what that was. Yep. So. That's, I, I'm assuming a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's kind of my two things. Is That's my job, like uh, what I went to school for and then. Lip Ripper is obviously the fishing side, so right, which I don't really post good. anything about work, so but I mean, <laughs> right? Well, we, we already learned something, Ken. So this episode's already been a learn. We're on a roll already. We're so we're on pace. We're on pace. We are on pace. Yeah. My wife was like, but, uh, are, you gonna, "Are you guys going to be quick tonight?" And I was like, "I don't know," but apparently we're just we're firing at all cylinders right now, so it might be. We are. I mean, that's <laughs> my wife said the same thing. She was like, "How long are you going to be this time?" You know, like <laughs> after last one, I'm like, "I don't know." Who knows? We're probably hour and a half i said so we'll see we'll see but you know beforehand we talk a little bit and afterwards maybe a little bit so i think we can we can do it we can get back and improve them we can be succinct we can be concise yeah. and uh stay focused somewhat so why don't we do that we'll start with uh, the first topic which is the major league fishing flw merger it's it's a, a buyout really major league fishing buying out flw and you know, Chad Hoover, as far as the kayak bass fishing side goes, he has posted a live video and posted a, a made a post, I should say, on the KBF members only group, basically just explaining he, you know, he only knows so much so far. And there's a lot to be sorted out, you know, as, as they've now merged, there's a lot to, they got to figure out before they even get to the whole kayak bass fishing side of things. But the bottom line is they're pretty fired up on kayak fishing, major league fishing by they, that's what I mean. They, they like it. They, they think it's, there's a lot of growth in this area, but, uh, but really FLW and kayak bass fishing is this is what Chad was saying, have to sort of sell that vision that they've already collaborated on. They already, you know, have a, a passion for and a, a sort of a, a vision. They got to sell that now to major league fishing in hopes that they will buy into that vision as well and continue to partner with kayak bass fishing so we'll have to see how that goes i don't i don't think that's gonna be a problem at all do you i mean it's it makes sense to me major league fishing already does catch you know uh yeah. way release so i think a lot think of the <clears throat> uh 
uh, what am I thinking of? Um, a lot of the way that they view um, competitive fishing, it, it lines up with what we do in kayaks, like the catch photo release versus the catch weigh release, the care of the fish, the, you know, that sort of stuff is, is very, very in the forefront of what they're doing. And I think that there's just a lot of steps that align with it. So it doesn't seem like, I think there's just a lot of um, behind the scenes stuff that just needs to get retied. I don't think that there's any sort of butting heads in the viewpoint of it. And it doesn't make sense not to at least try, I guess, with the kayak fishing world to me, because that's only another outlet to bring more people to your brand as the MLF. Like, I, right. I would be surprised if something isn't worked out. So I, I'm not I really too worried about it, to be honest. I'm not either. And I think that, with the FLW tour schedule already previously posted and they're going to let that play out. I think the only difference is there's now going to be an angler of the year championship as opposed to a quote unquote FLW cup, which was their previous championship, the title, of their previous championship event mm-hmm. that kayak bass fishing also went to and qualified for. Now the question is going to be, will the pro tour for kayak bass fishing, this new pro tour, will they tie into this new angler of the year championship that the FLW tour has which is just like Bassmaster. The Bassmasters got the Angler of the Year Championship. They held it on Lake Sinclair, uh, what was it, a couple weeks ago? And so that's really the only question. Will they tie into that event like they did with the Cup, or will they not? And they'll let the existing FLW Tour play out, it sounds like. One thing One thing I did notice, there was a press release, Ken, and I don't know if you noticed, there's also another link that, that uh, Major League Fishing was putting out. I think FLW had a link to it as well. It says how – like. With the merger, how will this affect me? You know what I mean? If you're an angler that fishes mm-hmm. at any level of FLW, how does this affect me? And one thing I did learn is that the FLW tour, the main tour, this it's got, I think they have six or seven stops, no, seven stops probably already announced. And then, of course, they the cup or the angler of the year championship now uh, was the location is not announced. But those locations are set. But here's how it's going to change. Instead of a normal, I think they have four-day events, now or they used to and now they're moving to six days just like major league fishing i don't know if you saw that so that the the tour is going to go to six days what's going to happen is they're not forcing the flw guys yet to use the major league fishing format uh for the entire tournament what's going to happen is the first three days of the tournament it's regular five bass bring them bring them back in the live well regular five bass and then they cut it to 20 and then they've got like they go from they fish those 20 Oh, man, I'm trying to think. Well, you get the idea. You, it moves to the Major League Fishing format for the final two days or three days. I can't remember. I have to look at it. it I, think the I, final, I might have found it. The Pro the Circuit will days. operate on a six-competition schedule that features FLW's traditional five-fish limit format on days mm-hmm. one through three. Transitioning into the MLF catch way, immediate release, every scoreable bass counts format on days four through six, which include two 10-angler knockout rounds and a final 10-angler championship round. And yeah. in this this case, in all rounds of MLF Bass Pro Tour, ML, MLF appointed and officials will manage the competition and weighing of the fish the final three days of the FLW Pro Circuit. So they're kind of blending the two. Yeah, they're blending it. So that way they can keep the schedule as is because it was already announced. Everybody else down the, the Costa Series, the BFLs, if, if anybody listening even follows and knows what those are and all the high school and college fishing, they still do five fish live well situation so i don't know if that's them trying to morph this thing eventually into all mlf style you know the catch way yeah. release another thing i've heard uh, a lot of if you look on the the announcement on flw or mlf's instagram facebook whatever and it, any chat chat rooms forums basically the biggest complaint i've seen from a lot of people a lot of guys don't like the one pound scoreable bass as many as you can catch format. Yeah. And they think it's a dink fest. It's not like one guy can sit on a school of one pounders and just win. I'm just like, dude, I, I don't know about you. I just don't know if I buy that. You know what I mean? I don't, it's first of all, it's hard to even find a school of, of any fish anywhere. And second of all, you're not, it's like you're throwing a rooster tail, man. You're, you can't even um, risk throwing a small bait to catch smaller fish because if they're not a pound, they don't score. Everyone's still throwing the same lures. You're still trying to catch five and six pounders, you know, yeah, chatterbait, spinnerbait. I mean, topwaters. What? 
if you catch a five pound bass, that's way more efficient than catching five ones mm-hmm. in the time that it takes. So like it, it now, are you searching for like eight, 10 pounders? Maybe not necessarily at that point, but it does ramp up effectiveness of like what fish you're going for. And, and it's the same degree with what we do in kayak fishing. Like most of our tournaments have a 12 inch minimum. So if you're just looking to fill your limit, you need that one last fish just so you don't, so you turn in a full bag. Like I, you don't always like yeah. downgrade to a rooster tail. Cause you're going to catch a bunch of bluegill and eight inch, nine inch, 10 inch, 11 inch fish that aren't going to count. Yeah. So if you're going to fish for, you know, an average fish, you might as well be using something that could potentially bring in that 19, mm-hmm. 20 incher that will put you over the top anyway. So like it, it I think there's a, ha- I think it's more of a happy medium than, and then people are trying to to undercut it a little bit with that mentality. Yeah. I think so. There's got to be some happy medium, like you're saying. Eventually, we can go to forever. You know what I mean? It's got to be something. Yeah. But and whether I, that's I, whether I that's know. something like they do blend this a little bit, and like let's say when it gets down to the top ten guys, yeah, they're still catch weigh release, but it's their five biggest on, on the mm-hmm. final day. So they're not they're not counting every scoreable bass that they catch necessarily but they still weigh them immediately and then they mm-hmm. only take their best five. So they're right. still big fish hunting, but every fish mm-hmm. needs to be, every fish that you catch needs to be weighed on the boat. Hey, you know what, you know what else I was thinking about just now? I mean, you could even do it where it's on the final few days, it's your best 10. You could up it one yeah. level because. Yeah. That's, I mean, that would make more sense too, because it, cause more fish would be, would matter than, yeah. than just five. Cause a lot of times you're pulling in. See, here's what's cool about MLF. Okay. Think about it with bass and FLW, the way it has been. Once you get five, if you hook a one pounder, two pounder, and you got a bunch of threes in there, there's no drama. It doesn't matter. There's no, like, there's no importance to that fish. You just ski them in, you shake mm-hmm. them off. You're trying to get them off. Your, it, it's like a bunch of non consequential, or if that's the right word, you know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're, they just don't matter. A ton of fish are being caught all day long. They don't matter. But with Major League Fishing, they're cutting back and forth to all these guys catching fish that matter. And they're like, really need to catch them, even though they're a pound and a half or a pound and three quarters. And that brings a lot of extra drama into yeah. the sport. Now, do you lose the live weigh-in and knowing who really wins or not wins? Yes, but a lot of times you already know anyway because that the bass track and the live scoring, it's even though it's technically not 100% accurate, it's pretty darn close. And how often is it where – two people are so close that you really need to go to the scales, yeah. you know, live to figure out who won. A lot of times the guy's up by three or four pounds and you know, okay, maybe he really won by two or maybe it's pound and a half. It could be five, but he won. So yeah. I don't think you lose a ton of drama there. I don't know, man. I'm kind of, it, the more fish you put in a stringer, the more the cream will rise to the top. So if you make it as many fish as possible, look who won. Edwin Evers. Do we all not agree? He's probably the best bass angler out there right now he probably is and he won so the more fish you put on the stringer your virtual stringer whatever you want to call it live well the more the cream will rise to the top because you think about it if it's just one fish you can go out there in a lake with a hundred people and the worst angler could luck into an eight pounder and he wins well and just to correlate that you can Mm -hmm. can, if you're not into the professional bass fishing world and you don't follow it but you are into the kayak world just over the past couple years look at the transition from the three fish format to the five fish format you were having super tight races of 25 people by a quarter to an inch difference and then you go to a five fish format and it drops down to maybe 10 people or Mm -hmm. even less because it is much harder to catch five big fish than it is to only catch three big fish in, yeah. in a lot of time. Right. So the, the higher you make that limit, <clears throat> the, the one you're going to create more, a more dynamic system for people fighting for a slightly bigger paycheck. If they're paying out to however many spots, you know what I mean? So I would rather be in yeah. sixth than seventh and that's a dynamic race that you have. And it has a lot of interest and drama, like you said, in it, versus then it wouldn't that it wouldn't have without that because you could catch two fish and then bump up where you have to hunt for a certain fish if it's total if it's just the the biggest ones that you have in your live well sort of thing like like what you were saying this one doesn't matter this one doesn't matter they all matter because if i catch five of them i could potentially Mm -hmm. catch up so but the the more you put that limit on 
the better you have to be at fishing overall. And you're not going to go for one pounders. There's no way you could catch 81 pounders in the uh, in a allotted amount of time. So you want to go for those bigger ones that are going to get you to skyrocket up to that 80 pound mm -hmm. mark in a day because you're catching a bunch of three to five pounders. Right. I mean, I agree. I think the only slight difference, honestly, I, I didn't watch this particular tournament this year, but I believe Aaron Martin's won one and he won it drop shotting or in finding a school of a bunch of small bass. And the only difference I think that this going from a five fish to unlimited number of fish, he wouldn't have stayed on a school of small fish if he already had those, you know, fish that those yeah. same size in the live well, he would have moved to find bigger fish somewhere, but he was able, but based on the format to just stay in that spot and keep catching them. But um, I mean, I don't, I get both sides of it, but I just didn't see it play out enough this year where, I don't know, maybe they make it two. Uh, maybe just the solution is you make it a two pound bass, you know what I mean? Or pound and a half. Well, yeah, yeah. There's lots of th like, this is, I mean, the MLF isn't necessarily new, but <clears throat> the format still has time to perfect if there's something yeah. that we need to perfect or they need to perfect to evolve, so, exactly to, so is it a two pound minimum for it to score is it uh an inch you know requirement and then how much does it weigh like you know yeah do you have that's to, true uh you know it, it could be an inch requirement it could also be dependent on the fishery because some fisheries if you're on hartwell maybe a one pounder is a good fish but if you're on lake fork yeah, the limit should be two pounds or even three before it counts. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I mean, they could change it. Yep. Exactly. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. That we'll see how it all plays out and how it affects the kayak fishing world. I, I only think it could, could be good because there's deeper pockets now. They've merged together. There's deeper pockets um, backing all of this. And then on top of that, you know, Bass Pro Shops obviously owns – uh, big big owner or main sponsor, whatever you want to call it, of Major League Fishing, and they sell kayaks. So why would they not want to be in the kayak fishing scene mm -hmm. on the tournament scene? I don't know. So I think it's good. The other flip side of this that we haven't even talked about yet is now the big three tournament trails are down to two in a sense. And that means BASS is the lone tournament series without a, you know kayak fishing events. And rumor has it, you know, beep, 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 breaking mm -hmm. news. We need to drop for that, by the way. Maybe that I can cut this out. Actually, probably not. That wasn't very good, but <laughs> it was probably not very good. But I believe they're going to be announcing. Have you heard this, Ken? I think they're going to announce kayak tournaments for next year. I think they're doing four. I've heard some dark rumors. Four. Yeah, I've heard some. Yeah, rumors. Yeah. So we'll see. So now it's forced their hand to get into the kayak fishing scene. So on top of every single tournament we just listed off on the last podcast, dude, we're going to have four more added into it. And not just four like, oh, it's some trail series level or local club level. We're talking like four at Bassmaster is putting on level. So and if I had to guess, man, if KBF is already connected with MLF and FLW, this is just a wild guess. I have zero insider information on this, but there's only one other sizable national i should say kayak fishing tournament trail and that's hobie so yeah. i if i had to guess if they partnered with anybody and they've partnered with hobie so we'll have to see if that's true i don't know but yeah there's a couple decent regional ones that have been pretty big but nothing national wise like hobie or kbf right yeah yeah regional tournaments they're kind of one-off solo tournaments that some people just run every year or something. Yeah, there's some trails yeah. that span four or five states with their regional stuff, but um, that do pretty well. But I don't think anything that's on the level of the Hobie Bass Opens or I agree or KBF. Not quite, anyway. Right. I, I think that's what's going to happen. Now, here's the other question. When that happens, will they allow motors? Because here's the other thing. If, if they're tied in, if Bass is tied in with um, – Sponsor, let's say, I don't know if they, who they're sponsored by, but I'm sure Mencota, Lawrence, Garmin, whatever, any of these companies that have trolling motors are sponsors of, of Bassmaster. And because they are, when they come out with, which is probably going to be next year, let's face it, that one of these companies I think would be dumb not to come out with, up with a, uh, a trolling motor like a Torquedo, something smaller that's built for kayaks. When that happens, will that force 
their hand to allow motors in their turn in the tournaments if if they don't right from the get go. I don't know. Yeah. But I bet you it's a big a big part of it. You know. I think Minn Kota is one of the official sponsors of bass. Mm-hmm. Probably. So we'll have to see if if there is a partnership with Hobie bass open series or if hobie's some sort of major sponsor or not and if so will they allow motors or not uh we'll have to we'll just have to wait and see on that but yeah. it'll be interesting to see how it goes down but i just want to say i definitely uh, think it's a good thing and i like the mlf format to some extent it can be tweaked like like you said but you know there's time to to get it to evolve i don't think it's gonna i like five fish right now for the kayak side i don't think yeah. unlimited or maybe one day if, if MLF ever goes to 10 fish and they change their format to 10, that could be interesting. That could be cool on the yeah. kayak side, getting to 10 because that's not easy, man. Catching 10 fish no. a day on some of these fisheries, that's not easy. And that will separate just like the more days you have in a tournament, the, the more the cream rises to the top, like we've already discussed, the more, you know, number of fish on, the stringer, yeah. same thing happens. The true best anglers always will rise. It's it's kind of well, like angler of the year, you know. Yeah, and, that, and that, just back to comparison's sake again, like just work fishing in the national championship, the KBF national championship. Like you have to fish five fish three days in a row, and that's mm-hmm. not easy. And you know, I maybe caught nineteen scoreable bass in those three days. I just was lucky enough that I had five each day. And I did well mm-hmm. enough. You know what I mean? So like thinking about catching 10 in one of those days would have been difficult for me, I think. So like having to do that, you know, that, that just is going to be a premium sort of level that is really just shows talent or having a good day or a good week. Yeah. I mean, it's just what it is. Right. Uh, well, a couple the last thing I'll say is a couple of things that Chad mentioned I haven't mentioned yet is he he did allude to the fact that he's leaning towards the, the 250 price point for the pro series. Mm-hmm. I kind of wish it'd be like 300, but he's leaning towards 200 or 250. So even 200. Yeah. A lot of people are wanting it to go down to 200. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, well, I don't know, but I would rather it be higher. But that's just me. I know. What was people, he saying? Was he saying that that championship is going to be like a thousand dollar entry fee? Is that what he was saying? Or, yes. Yeah. 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 He was saying that if if he does go low to two hundred, then the the championship event will probably be more like a seven fifty or thousand dollar entry fee, because it's I I don't know if you'll have to qualify to get in that event or not. Maybe you will, but basically say like you should be able to over time build up your money, win some money, whatever, and if you're doing if you're not doing good, you didn't make any money, you're probably not going to the championship anyway because you're thinking, I'm just going to lose again, possibly. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, if it's that expensive, 750 or 1000 bucks, that's a lot. But if you have time, at least you know it's coming and you know that, like, we, I think they really want to have a, a on stage a big, just like the FLW Cup, like they want to have a huge stage and a huge check. They give out, you know what I mean. So a thousand dollar entry yeah. would give them that, and it would give somebody just it would appear to be so much bigger and grander than all the other events are. Just like the KBF National Championship, it's just it's huge because of the number of people, and the entry fee is a decent amount, three hundred bucks, four hundred if you don't get in early enough. So I think that's what they want. That's yeah. why he wants to bump that up. Well, I think he's trying to drive. Um force not forced but inspire sponsorship too because like mm-hmm. if you are at the point where you're getting invited to this pro tour championship that you have a quality of you that should be supported by someone and i think th- i, I yeah, think he right. may be trying to develop that as if you can make it to that point then you might be at the point where somebody's willing to help you sort of thing yeah, exactly. Because yeah, he, that's what he said. He did say something about that. Yeah. They're trying to make it be like if you make it here, you are going to be all, like whether you do well here or not. If you do well here, great. But if you make it to this point, you will be noticed, and mm-hmm. that is worth that. the The amount of notice that you are getting is going to be worth it for someone to help you get there if you qualify. Yeah. So I think that's what he's trying to inspire. And I think that it could work. It's just going to take a lot of belief and a lot of put up by KBF when it comes mm-hmm. down to 
how much exposure and how much, you know, how big of a wingspan this tournament gets when it comes down to it. Right. I mean, if you're an angler that just did, let's say you did okay all throughout the year and you qualify for this, if it, if it indeed is a qualification, you should maybe be able to hit up some, some folks that have supported you with product and say, look, I mean, I really want to fish this. I want to win this for you guys. I've done pretty well to this point. Uh, could you pitch in $250 and then ask another uh, sponsor, can you pitch in 250 And by the time you do that two or three times, you might only have to pay 250 out of your own pocket. You know what I mean? Or, or nothing. Hopefully that's the idea. So we'll have to see how it goes. The last thing he did say as well is he's, he's working on two or three other potential open FLW, uh, KBF. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what to call them anymore. KBF pro series open events where you win They're standalone events. You don't have to fish the whole tour and get, uh, up in the, the points or whatever to qualify for the Angler of the Year Championship. Yeah. But they're just, you win and you're in to that yeah. event. And he, so they're standalone events. So he we'll, kind we'll of see. alluded to the fact that it may be somewhere near some of the gaps in the yeah, like geographical the schedule. Sure. Yeah. I would say Northeast. He actually, maybe, is there more? I don't know. He, he kind of was saying maybe the Midwest or something. I can't remember. Yeah. It was something mentioned- half vague. It wasn't like. It wasn't. Yeah. Take it to the bank. It wasn't that sort of thing. You just saying, let's just spitball out here. It's here, here, and here. So, all right, that'll be cool. Well, uh, let's get into some other stuff unless you got any other comments. No, I think that. we covered a, I think we covered a pretty good opinion on that happening and there's nothing really much more to talk about it until we get some official word on the kayak series part of it, because that's exactly. where we are. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't have a big boat to fish from. So the rest of it doesn't mean much to me other than being a fan. Exactly. Well, I do um, want to move on, but the last thing we'll say is folks, don't forget we are still doing a podcast. I've already talked to Craig die. He's in Craig dies in. He wants in on this uh, fantasy KBF we pick five people each. I'm looking for. I'm going to find. If you know of anybody, Ken, uh, let me know. I'm going to find a couple more. I bet, I bet Matt Ball might do it with us. But anyway, a couple more people to join in. We'll probably what have maybe five people, five or six people on yeah, the think, podcast. We all pick five people. Yeah, I think that would be pretty fun. I think that would be manageable. Be, Anything more than that would maybe get to like a nightmare of audio. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's and now with Bass coming in with four events, potentially, then that's another. And then these new open events that Chad's talking about. I mean, good grief between Hobie, uh, you know, KBF, Bass, KBF Trail Series, if we're counting those, which we should. I mean, I don't think we should go down to club levels, but any money earned in those sort of major tournament series will will count. So that'll be a way that we score it. Should be fun. Absolutely. All right, so let's see. We got uh, some questions here. Um, all right, Ken, you want to shoot one about uh, your first one you had here? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was thinking about this the other day about um, lures and baits and when to use them, and because somebody asked one of my buddies asked me a question, and I was like, you know what? Like, I, I'm not really sure, so I thought I'd bring it up to Drew. And I know that uh, one of his favorite lures is the chatterbait from Z-Man. And I, I like using the, the chatterbait. It's, it's something that I keep around, but I'm not as technical with it as Drew is. And I have a couple, I have a handful of them. I just tie one on and use it. And I know that there's different weights and different types of jig heads and stuff like that. So I guess my, or the question was, is how do you decide what weights to use in what situations to make that chatterbait most efficient or to um, entice some of those bites when, when you need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and just like any uh, bass pro on a bass boat, you know, if they're a jig fisherman, most guys are going to have two, three, four, I mean, five different jigs and different weights and different trailers potentially on there and different colors you know, on their boat at one time, we obviously can't carry quite as many rods, but I do often have two or three chatterbaits tied on, uh, just depending, they're very cast dependent. You know what I mean? If you're fishing right below a dam and it's a major river system, like I'm talking like a big, big body of water, right? So Tennessee river, um, you know, just any big river right Mm -hmm. below a dam or some deep holes, lots, lots of volume is the word I'll say volume of water. You know, I definitely will throw a heavier 
lure, you kind of want to contact the bottom sometimes, you know, get it down underneath the current that's just going to sweep it down. So it's very cast dependent and at the same time on that exact same river system up shallow in some little backwaters or up shallower, you know, you may want a very lightweight, like a three eighths instead of a, an ounce or ounce and a quarter. I've used an ounce and a quarter uh, jackhammer chatterbait. That's the heaviest one they make. And the best example I can actually give you on this question is I was actually uh, fishing the Pan American Kayak Bass Championships. And Shannon Williams and I, we went up a creek together. And when I got to this, there was actually a waterfall at the very, as far as you can go up this creek. And the whole time up the creek, I'm using a three eighths. It's a small, skinny water. And obviously the heavier lure you throw, the faster you have to wind. So it doesn't hit the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Just sit there on the bottom and just bounce. So you got to so the lighter you go, you can, and if you hold your rod tip up high, you can even move it slower, you know, creep it and almost wake it on the surface with like a three eighths. And uh, so in a creek, I've got that three eighths because it's, it's so shallow. If, if I was using an ounce or say a half ounce or three quarters, I mean, you'd have to really be burning that thing in order to keep it off the bottom. So you guys can all see the longer your lure stays in the strike zone and usually in a river situation, you kind of know where, especially on a small creek too, kind of know where they're going to hit. So you want to kind of have that bait hovering in that spot as long as possible. That's why actually a spinner bait is really good too, because it holds really well with those blades in, in the strike zone. Chatterbait does almost as good, but uh, going across current, you can actually get it to hold in a, in a spot a little bit more than you could bringing it straight downstream. But long story short, in this creek, I've got a three set chatterbait tied on. I believe I had maybe a half ounce but then at the very end of the creek where the waterfall is, as far as we go up the creek, it's pouring in. It's just white water. And I threw uh, in the same spot. I let Shannon fish this area first, actually, where the white water was coming in. She didn't really, maybe she caught one or she didn't really get that many bites and she moved. And I went in there with a ounce and a quarter jackhammer. I know no one's ever thrown an ounce and a quarter jackhammer in this creek in this spot. And it's able to sink underneath those rapids a lot quicker. And I started pulling out small mouth, like boom, boom, boom. Uh, almost every cast. Cause it didn't get swept across the surface like a light three eighths would. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm imagining that that's able to get down into that undercut mm -hmm. from the waterfall to where that calm water is, where they're just kind of basically button up to it, waiting for something to get yeah. down to them. Yeah, exactly. They're just looking straight up in that calm water underneath there. And that happens a lot, whether it's a dam, uh, you know, a mill dam, spillway, whatever you want to call it, an actual um, hydro dam where, you know, you've got the generators that comes up the bottom. I mean, you need a heavy bait sometimes. We're just in a river that's got a lot of volume of water. I mean, if you're on the lower Flint River, the Chattahoochee River, uh, middle or lower Chattahoochee River, you know, the new river, big, big water, you know, um, Susquehanna. And obviously it's very dependent sometimes on the time of year because in the winter, spring, there's more volume and that's when you're going to use the heavier and then the lighter is going to be clear water sometimes or um, skinnier water. The other thing about the light one that I've already alluded to is you can, you can swim it on the surface and wake it. So it becomes a whole different bait almost. You're almost throwing a wake bait. Not, I mean, it'll come out of the water sometimes and then you got to slow down a little bit to get it back in or lower, start lowering your rod tip. But the weight is definitely critical uh, another reason to switch is for cast distance. Sometimes you got to hit a target that's far away. You got you got two options. You can paddle over there, or you can have a longer rod. You know, at least a seven foot. I like seven six, medium heavy, or you can cast over there. It's a lot easier to make a cast than it is to um, sit down and paddle or pedal your way over somewhere and then make the cast of that piece of structure. So. Yeah. That's a big player in it, but well, um, especially if you're in a spot that has a bunch of different runs in it. Like if you are set up in like a calm area of like below one of these like waterfalls or something that you're talking about, and there's you know different runs that one that's five feet away, one that's fifteen feet away, the one that's twenty five feet away. Like you could cast to that one that's twenty five feet away to potentially hook up, and you may not mm -hmm. have a spot to get your kayak over to that one, or it's going to take exactly. you twenty minutes exactly. to fight the current over there to find a spot where you can set up and now you've just wasted a quarter of an hour. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. getting there. Whereas yeah. if you just can cast over there, you do it all from the same spot. That's right. It, it's just really is amazing how you just kind of start to, to figure it out. Once you have a few on the boat, because let's say you're fishing uh, 
off of a bank, but you're, let's say you're paralleling a bank, but you're fishing off of it like 10, 15 yards. So you're, so it's deeper. You know, I don't know, maybe it's 10 feet deep there, eight feet deep, you know, six to 10 feet, something like that. You really want your bait, just like a spinner bait, crank bait, anything. You always want it ticking the bottom. You want it bumping off of stuff, right? I mean, everyone kind of knows that if you've, you're a bass fisherman, you want your bait hitting things, knocking on things. That's where the fish are. They're ha- they hang out in the structure. So, you know, unless you're hitting it, you don't know if maybe the, the depth there is, maybe it's 20 feet and you're sitting there throwing an eight foot and obviously not getting bit because you're not down there hitting the structure. So you want to find the chatterbait that you can crank uh, at a, you know, a, light, a nice medium pace, let's say, and hit the structure. And of course, if you're, if you're hitting it and you're just constantly beating off of it, then you, you need to like, you know, maybe it's because it's too shallow. It's like four foot and you're trying to throw a three quarter ounce and you need a half or a three eighths because you're, you're just pounding the bottom way too much. You know, if you're coming back and your chatterbait is just the paints off of the bottom of the lead head, then obviously, you know, go a little bit lighter or hold your rod tip a little higher. But if you're not hitting anything, you just need to keep going heavier. It's simple as that until you start hitting the bottom. And then hold your rod tip up a little higher and crank a little bit faster, and you'll stay just above that structure. And every once in a while, you can lower your rod tip or slow down and, and feel it again in case the depth has changed. And there you go. That's all you got to do. Yeah, a little bit of a depth finder technique without having to paddle over it or even have one on your on your boat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, of course, um, you know, water clarity has something to do with it, too. I mean, if, if it's clear water, you can certainly, if it's warm temperatures and clear water, you, you burn it a lot faster. And you want to keep it near the surface because, uh, you know, in that clear water, you want to force them to react and strike it. Uh, where if it's muddy water, you might want to slow down and, and really kind of give them a chance to hone in on it with their lateral line and find it. So, uh, you know, I think that's about, about covered the topic. Yeah, but uh, definitely so, a versatile bait you can you can make work for you. And I actually just got I'm about to actually open up the box. I got a new Z-Man box at home, and I got those new CFLs in the ones that I are, was uh, just going to ask you yeah. uh, if the CFLs were going to make this process any different. They should uh, because supposedly they don't they don't want to rise up like the other ones. Mm-hmm. But I haven't thrown them yet, so we'll just have to see if they actually hug the bottom. I, I know they don't like dive really per se, but so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do a part two on this question after you. Uh, I guess we will yeah. try these out. That's right. That's right. So that's a good question. And um, speaking of the bottom, cranking and hitting the bottom a lot, you know, we can move. This is a nice little segue here to our next topic about winter, late fall, winter fishing. You know, it's coming up soon. A cold front just snapped through the, the country. I actually saw a lot, of, a lot of the guys up there fishing the Trail Series Championship in Lacrosse, and it was snowing. Um, on the way for some people. I know Mike Elsie, I saw his post, it was snowing and it's going to be cold up there. So I know it's definitely still top water time here in the Southeast, but believe it or not, soon enough, it will happen. And we will be in this sort of late fall winter and up there where you are, Ken, you're kind of going to be there quicker. So Mm -hmm. the fish are going to start stacking up in the winter holes. And I know it's tough for some folks uh, to get out there in the winter or they don't feel like it but man it really can be an awesome time to catch fish because they do stack up all together you just got to find them that's the hard part but that cfl a bait like that to kind of slow down and just crawl on the bottom and knock stuff would be a great search bait to find you know where they are if you find one you're probably gonna you know find more than one so um winter fishing what are some of uh your thoughts on winter fishing and, and late fall uh fishing I, we, we talked about this before the podcast that, that late fall is probably very similar to winter here in, in your area is probably centered to the closer to the winter in the southeast so anywhere i don't know where where would you say like above north of tennessee um, kentucky indiana all the midwest and northeast is probably yeah i think i think southern kentucky to maybe the south of tennessee maybe like the unknown area um sort of thing because they can get snow and they can have bad winters but like they don't maybe necessarily freeze over as much as let's say michigan is just like ice and i know in ohio or at least northeast ohio it, it gets pretty cold and there are times of the winter where you could walk out on lake erie safely so 
towards mm -hmm. you know late January. It's been cold enough, long enough that you can actually walk on Lake Erie. Um, so it, it, it's so hard in learning how to late fall or winter fish is difficult for me because I just don't have a ton of experience in it because usually about the end of October, that's when you just pack all your stuff up unless you're a steelhead fisherman or something like that. So like right. having that few weeks, maybe three or four weeks of this late fall pattern, I just don't have that, like, and only being able to go out two or three days of those three weeks. So, I'll, you know, maximum four to six days a year to try to figure this stuff out. I just don't have it down. And it's yeah. something that I struggle with because I don't, I haven't had the time to put in to learn it. It's definitely tough, but I think, um, you know, I think now that we've set the stage that basically what we're about to talk about now is probably the late fall bite for anywhere further north. And then it's going to apply to the winter bite here in the south. And we're kind of going to be a little bit more specific because Ken and I do a lot of river bassing. This podcast is hooked on wild waters. We prefer to fish kind of more rivers and wild places. We're going to be a little bit more specific towards the rivers, although I'm sure a lot of this stuff does apply to lakes too. But what I look for is, you know how uh, on a river, Ken, you've seen this and you guys listening, I know you've seen this. Um, it'll come out of some woods, a river will come out of woods and it'll be like an open clearing or let's say it's power lines, you know, the cleared uh -huh. area. And these, these spots get a lot of sunlight, a lot more sunlight than the wooded areas. Cause one of the reasons we love rivers, especially in the summers, they're much cooler. It keeps the water cool uh -huh. because it's shaded with, with the trees. So some of your money spots for winter fishing, and this is, you know, even early spring, this even applies still in early spring. It's all this late fall through winter. It's obviously you want to hit something if you can on a, a three, four day warming trend. That's just like common knowledge. They're going to get a little bit more aggressive. But I find those clearing, those open areas, and then I find an eddy that has depth. So let's say you got, you know, six, seven, eight foot of water on a medium sized river. Creeks probably aren't going to be that deep, obviously, but deep for a creek might be four or five feet, but if you can find six, seven, eight, nine, ten foot of water in some sort of medium sized river out there that has some current flow still coming uh, on the main river and then an eddy that happens to be on a bank that gets a lot of sun, which is really going to be more of your, like, depending on how the river flows, obviously, but it's going to be still more of the, probably your west bank as the sun, you know, gets that morning sunlight hitting it. Mm -hmm. It warms up all throughout the day. That's pro that's what I look for. And if it's got a rock on it, some things that warm up, if you've got uh, murkier water, that's going to help the water warm as well. So that's kind of what I look for. And then you can parallel because what's crazy is they still hang out right on that current scene because they're still feeding a little bit in the winter. It's not like they just stop eating, you know, late fall and winter. But um, they're relating to that current scene still. And so if you can get on the cast that you're – basically bringing your bait right along the current scene, but you want to be just on the calm side, not actually in the current, bring it, you know, downstream straight with the current because then your bait doesn't work that good. You got to move it a lot faster if it's a spinner bait or chatter bait, crank bait, because, you know, you need the force of the, the water to make that bait work. The friction on the bill, the crank bait or the chatter bait lip. Yeah. That's why you want it on that calm side or the, the side that's almost, you know, moving back up the opposite direction. You put it just on that side you feel for the bottom, like we talked about with that CFL or, you know, the, the correct weight chatterbait spinnerbait is really good because you can fish a spinnerbait super slow and, uh, or a crankbait and you just keep cranking as many of those spots as you can until you get bit, but you may not get bit a lot because it's just not the time of year you catch, you know, a ton of fish, although you can, if you find a huge school of them, but you're probably going to be in a bigger, a pretty darn big river system to find a, a large school of fish. If you're yeah. in a creek or, or medium, you know, you might be looking at, you know, five or 10 fish hanging out there and you might catch a couple and they might turn the school off or whatever. But, but if you let that spot rest, you come back the next day, they're probably going to be there still again, you know? So that's my strategy for it. And uh, they, they like, if it's large mouth, you can, you know, throw a bigger uh, swim bait or something on the back of your chatter bait, or just throw a swim bait and a little bigger size down there. They'll definitely, take that bigger stuff, especially if it's uh, muddier water. 
Okay. So that's kind of because I was curious. Like I was like, so what would be your arsenal of lures, if you don't mind, like for if when you go like late fall or winter, I guess pattern for the southern states um, fishing? Because I know that you like to power fish, but ultimately cold means slow for the most yeah. part. So, like, how do you approach that with your power fishing mentality for the most part, or what lures do you? approach well, that still a, a power fish but slower like we just talked about your slow roll on your spinner bait your slow roll on the chatter bait uh but then once you find them with, with those and even and obviously it's not like i don't throw a jig until i get bit with a spinner bait or a chatter bait i mean obviously i'll pick up a jig at some some point too but the spot that i'm just so confident like there's got to be something there you certainly can pick up a jig uh, but i also have the jig for when you do find some fish with a spinner bait you throw back with a jig and you can possibly keep milk in that area for more fish. Uh, one good example was actually, it, and it still applies, even though it's uh, February, the story, but it, muddy water was coming in from a creek. And that's the other thing. Pay attention to the temperature of your rains, because if you get a warm rain and a creek is flowing in to a main river that is warmer, the fish will move instantly to that creek mouth. And you will find a ton of fish stacked up with the warm water you know, influx. Now, obviously, you're going to have a lot of – the opposite is going to happen, a lot of colder water coming in, right? Uh, and they can still be a, a creek mouse, but, you know, just pay attention to the weather. And if you do happen to get a warm rain, they can stack up there. But this story, uh, it was actually the same day, a long time ago. I can't remember what year it was, 2008-something. I don't know. Uh, Alton Jones won the Bassmaster Classic that day. It was a Sunday on Lake Hartwell. And his final day, he brought in eight pounds. He had a pretty good size lead, but he only brought in eight pounds, five fish. And I was not very far away. I lived in uh, Greenwood, South Carolina at the time. And there was a creek flowing in, into the river. It was warm. I had some murkier water coming in. And I threw a jig at that creek mouth and just sat there and proceeded to catch in like five casts, five different casts at all were over five pounds with a jig. And it was like 25 pounds of fish, just like that. So they'll stack up together, and a jig is certainly a good bait to use in the winter uh, and um, late fall and early spring to find them when they're stacked up. So that's a good one. Swim bait is a good one, like I just mentioned briefly, to slow roll down there. I mean, to me, it's just swim bait, chatter bait, jig, and uh, spinner bait. That's kind of my go-tos. Yeah. I know some people love it. They love crankbaits. I just don't, I just don't throw crankbaits as much as I probably should. Other people love throwing a jerk bait. You know, I just don't really get into it. It's just tough, tough for me to do personally. But I know they work great in the winter. So yeah, but those are my go-to's. So if when you're throwing a jig or if you are having a trailer or anything, like does your collar choice change in the winter patterns um, than say what you would do during the summertime? Like, are you just like white and black, or are you like does it depend on? Is it follow the same thing as in like? the water clarity, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. You know, that's a good one. Um, water clarity is definitely the biggest factor. And you've got murkier slash more milky water in the winter, especially on the rivers around here. But um, I like to use a lot of white on my swim baits and, you know, even the um, chartreuse uh, sexy shag color for like a chatter bait or spinner bait, something like that with a white, Swim bait trailer. I love doing that with moving baits, spinner baits, white and chartreuse. Mm -hmm. But on the jig, it's kind of uh, on the bottom when they're you know they're looking down at it. You're, I don't know. I just love throwing uh, just the normal kind of rounds and and with some orange tip crawfish fins, uh, fin up fins, pinchers, and um, browns and greens and all the normal kind of jiggy colors. You know, you would throw around wood. I don't know why I just do that, but I guess it's just because you're trying to always mimic the forage and you know, it's not a lot of white crawfish out there unless you're, you're fishing for bedding fish, you know, the white just doesn't really seem to work as well. So yeah, that's kind of what I do, but, uh, but I'll still throw in, in some clear water. I'll still throw that uh, like breaking brim color on a project Z chatter bait with uh, like a Houdini okay. color or bad chat or something. not bad chat. What's that color? I don't know, but there's, there's a, you know, just the colors that match. It looks like a brim. So every once in a while I'll throw that, but mostly in this murkier water, it's definitely the whites and the brighter stuff, chartreuses that kind of 
trying to get their attention a little bit. Gotcha. No, that that yeah. makes sense, and it kind of explains some of the the bites that I did get, you know, that I have gotten before in these sort of scenarios. So that, I think that's going to help a lot of people make sense of what to attempt anyway. Yeah, and even on lakes, um, this can apply. You know, you get those western banks that sort of, you know, if you think about it, when most of the country, the wind blows from, you know, east to west in the winter, in general, sometimes it obviously is coming more from our, from the north to south. But if you could, that's why if you can find a northwest bank, the, the trees are blocking it, the wind. So you're going to be able to have that bank warm up a little bit more than the other side of the lake because the sun also comes up from the south and the east in the winter, right? So now you've got the best of both worlds. South and the east sun's coming up hitting the northwest bank. Northwest bank also happens to not be getting hit with a bunch of wind. Oh, perfect. It's nice and calm. So it can uh, heat up quicker because if there's a lot of turbulence on the water, it's, you know, obviously the reason why a river doesn't warm up as quick as a lake is you got all that water moving in the flow. So you got, and then if you can find some stain in that nor uh, northwest side of a lake, anywhere on that side, you've got a little stain, a creek, creek arm that's feeding some stain into the water. I mean, you've got the recipe right there. Then find a point that's got, you know, or a, a ditch or a creek channel that's got that right depth, you know, 10, 12, 15 foot you probably can really, really nail some fish on a lake in the winter with a similar strategy. You know, if you see rock, it's going to heat up faster, riprap, um, even a lot of vegetation will hold some heat. So there you go. If you're a lake fisherman, that's about all I got, but it's very similar to what we just talked about in the rivers. Cool. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I would like to, I'd like to head down south uh, and try some of this stuff out with a little bit more of a comfortable area. I don't know. I might go after some steelhead this year. I haven't quite figured it out yet. My plans for the winter. Time. Well, you got to make at least one trip. You know, I know how it is up there. You know, my in-laws live near you and it's, it's a long period of cold. You got to at least get out of there once or twice to some warmer, sunnier skies, you know? So yeah. in the meantime, obviously steelhead, are, they're a lot of fun. So get out there and catch those but speaking of winter fishing i do want to touch on the uh clothing yes and uh how you gotta you know it's definitely something to not mess around with i always have a dry bag of with an extra set of clothes and uh, of course this year now i'm gonna have my angler aid kit so i've got one of those if you haven't seen the angler aid kits they're pretty cool to always keep in your kayak and even more so in the winter has everything you could possibly need if anything happens. And then um, I prefer the moisture wicking materials, but the ones that are like a polar tech, you know what I'm talking about? Coca Tat makes a lot of them. They're really good. These layering. Yep. And basically you can wring them out. If you get wet and you fall in, there's such a lightweight synthetic sort of fiber. You can wring them out and put them right back on and you're just as dry and just as warm as you were before you got wet. So if you're wearing cotton, jeans like sweatpants in the winter like you're out of your mind you're setting yourself up to, for a very very bad day very bad day absolutely and i would you know if you can get a pair of waders that have the, the food, footies you know mm -hmm. or just some, some pants that have those footies i mean that's the way to go you can get some warm socks in there again some wool or some some sort of fleece type uh, synthetic socks and you'll be able to stay dry and warm all day long. So that's, that's what I would recommend on the clothing. Yeah. I think the and gold really standard is going to be like a, mm -hmm. a dry suit, but yeah. you know, depending on where you're at too, um, the further South you go, the less necessary some of this stuff can be. But if you're out up by me, you know, a dry suit is going to be the gold standard. Is that something that everybody's going to put on every time? No, but you need to be as careful as possible because it, it can be a very, very, dangerous situation very quickly so take take what you're wearing seriously and if it's if you have to layer too much to be comfortable to be able to maneuver your kayak you should probably think twice about going at that point if you don't have the proper yeah. equipment exactly uh you know one thing i just just forgot about that i've caught a lot of fish on in some mountain streams that are like warm water streams in north georgia mountains mm -hmm. i used to whack some fish in the winter on just a 1 16th ounce Texas rig curly tail worm, like a green pumpkin curly tail worm. And any oh, little baits grub. like that, like a little, yeah, a little finesse bait, something like that. 
even though it's going to be a lot slower to sink and you're like, oh man, I got to sit here and wait for this thing to get down there. A lot of times you're going to, if you find them, they're going to be on before it even hits the bottom because it looks so natural, like a dying, you know, bait fish or whatever. But don't, so if it's clear, clear water in the winter, that's a killer bait. Get your spinning rod out. You could drop shots of fish even, or um, throw just something small like a, you know, a finesse worm, uh, hula sticks or something like that for Z-Man makes, um, you know, their, their new ticklers. Anything small like that would be great on super clear, clear uh, places. So, yeah, I just forgot about that. I wanted to mention it. Then I do finesse fish a little bit in the winter if it's super clear. Oh, All right. that dirty, dirty word, finesse. I know, I know. <laughs> rarely, rarely do it, but I'm forced to at certain times. If I'm finesse fishing, usually it's it's a problem. It means nothing yeah. nothing else. It's, it's an emergency <laughs> stick on the kayak. That's right. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else we have here, man. Um, we have another question. Is that it? Um, that be it. Uh, didn't run. We talked about winter fishing. Talked about my chatterbait question. Um, so I'll just, we talked about this two or three times already. Does winter fishing change your line choice? Well, not a whole lot, honestly, because I'm throwing, which we've talked about this in previous podcasts, but I'm throwing on spinning reels, you know, eight, 10 pound test. And I don't, you know, I don't really use a lot of leader. If you uh, haven't listened to our podcast where I talk about that, you can go back and yeah. kind of hear my rant on it. But I, I mean, I just use such light braid that I've just never seen anyone get more bites than I have. Again, we're fishing wild places that aren't quite as pressured as yeah. your, you know, bigger lakes out there. It's not like it's Kentucky Lake or Hartwell or Lake Lanier or whatever, you know? Yep. So maybe it matters for you guys. But either way, I still just throw like eight, 10 pound tests on the spinning rod. And I'll, I'll go 10 or 12 if it's like more stained straight braid and then also straight braid 30 pound on most of the applications on the bait casters. But if you are in vegetated, vegetated, is that the word? Let's say lakes or rivers with a lot of vegetation, just in case vegetated is not a word. <laughs> which it doesn't, I don't think it is. My intuition is telling me that's not a word. But you get what I'm saying. It's, it's now a word. It's a Drew word. Yep, it's a Drew word. If you're word. in those kind of vegetated environments, <laughs> you will be able to use 50 or 60 pound braid to flip and pitch, of course, which is what you'd be using in, in the summer, yeah. spring and summer anyway. So it doesn't really change it a lot. I mean, if you're crank baiting or doing, or, um, you know, you're trying to get to the bottom with a lighter weight, uh, lure, you could always downsize to like 20 pound braid. It's going to help it get down because don't forget braid floats. So, you know, you kind of want to get it, um, the thinner braid you get, the less it's going to float. So it's going to help you get down deeper crank baits, the, the thinner your diameter, it's going to get you deeper. You would only switch because of trying to get to the correct depth if you need it to. Yeah. So that's what I was curious. Whole... That's why I brought it up. I was just curious if it, yeah. since it was a floating material, most of the time of what you use, if, since you were talking about getting down and ticking the bottom a little bit more often in the winter time, if that was made an effect in your choice but yeah but i um i will say the winter is a good time to do all your tinkering you know we, we will touch on this real quick so i know you do some other things in the winter i prefer to work on some different lure techniques and tinkering reorganize all of my tackle rig anything up on my kayaks because uh, i kind of get new kayaks uh from jackson every fall and i gotta re-rig them for the uh you know winter spring because the season starts in like January. That's when tournaments, January, February is when it kicks off, really. So, you know, you actually got to, you don't have that long, honestly. And then um, I do a ton of satellite scouting and, you know, you can watch videos, YouTube, just do all that kind of research for any tournament you're fishing, all the satellite scouting, make your own maps, go into Google Maps and click on my maps. Hopefully you all have a Google account and start making your own maps and dropping pins with potential spots you think could look good. Go search on some Navionics maps. You can do so many things in the winter. I mean, what else? Is there anything else you do in the winter? Hmm. Not, not productive, no. I get a second job <laughs> so I can help pay for my kayaking addiction. All right. Well, there you go. I mean, that's, yeah, that's no, always it's, not to do. It's, it's a lot of scouting and planning for the year. Um, like you said, looking at maps, um, 
at the different tournaments to, to have an idea of to familiarize myself with, with the terrain. Um, gear prep, assess what I have. I think I've said it on here before. I don't roll with a lot of equipment. So over the winter time, I will break down and clean my reels, assess them, see if there is something I need to upgrade or um, make a point of purchasing um, in the next year to be prepared. If I have to replace a reel or I have found a technique that needs something slightly different than what I can accomplish with what I have. So, uh, you know, I only buy one reel or one rod or so per year as long as I don't break anything else. So that's, the winter time is a big assessment time for me. See what my goals are, what I need to prep for the next year to try to get through the next year. Like assess how many packs of Z-Man I have to buy, how many creature baits I have to buy. You know what I mean? Try to prep myself yeah. out for the year to be because there's always going to be extra stuff, but if I can get a, a financial basis of what I need to do for the year, it helps me um, not get behind um, that that upcoming right. next year. So that's what I do a lot in the in the fishing prep time for the winter for me. Well, speaking of organization and prep, I actually just got. Um, if you look on Instagram, I posted a IG video about um the plano edge that came in those things are awesome dude i gotta admit they're sturdy and stout you know tackle boxes the old style of just i don't know how they made the old ones but they kind of over time you know the hydro flows and all the other tackle boxes they just kind of wear out and kind of warp you know what i mean with the sun mm-hmm. and get, get out of shape man these things are sturdy i can't ever see that happening they are solid and it latches with like a du- double hinging system sort of like the difference in, uh, you know, how an Orion cooler will close with the whole latching system that, you know, really pulls the plastic down tight. Tightens it down rubber, on the seal. Say, yeah. Tightens it down. It's something sort of similar. It's like a double hinging system. It's so much, it's really nice uh, as opposed to, you know, like a Yeti cooler just has the the ball that you kind of pull down. Yeah. I think it's sort of equivalent to the difference in that, but it's, it's nice, man. And uh, I'm going to be loading those things up and we're actually going to film some episodes of Hooked on Wild Waters um i leave tomorrow to go film a a couple more so you guys will see some fall fishing in upcoming episodes Uh, i'm actually gonna fish with tim perkins on one of them and then another one i'm gonna fish with gene jensen so uh we'll get gene on the show and so uh look look forward to those and but another thing i was going to mention that i I, someone did ask we can do one more question is uh, about boat control how do you someone was asking online. I don't have the exact question now, but they were asking me, how do I, what are all the methods that I use to control, you know, my drift or control, uh, anchoring, uh, whenever I do anchor. Uh, and obviously if you've watched hooked on wild waters, you've seen any of the videos, there's lots of ways to do it. And actually Tim Perkins and I will be going upstream, uh, on one of the episodes, uh, coming up on the small Creek. And I believe, I will be using this method here, which is the front anchor wizard, where you can just drop like a small five pound dumbbell or something like that off of the front of your kayak with an anchor wizard. And then obviously you can fish and not get swept back downstream. It's perfect. You're just facing straight upstream. It's easy. Yeah. You want to move forward again. You just crank it right back up. Um, Do you ever use that method going upstream, Ken? Um, I have before. I don't go upstream very often. Um, when I go, I usually am doing a float trip because uh, <clears throat> lazy. <yep. laughs> so I haven't done it a ton. I have utilized it before, but um, a lot of the places I fish don't necessarily require a lot of anchoring to accomplish a good float so or, or a good um, uh, boat position for what I'm targeting. So I haven't needed it a ton, but... The, the concept makes sense and I've utilized it before. Yeah. Those little round balls are really good too. They're just mm-hmm. an anchor ball. Again, you just want to use something besides an actual anchor. That's a claw or something, you, you know, don't you hate to see one actually get caught. stuck, yeah. you know, get their anchor caught and stuck. So a drag chain even works off the front, but the problem with the chain, the reason why you don't use a chain is because it will dangle down. And when you're paddling forward, it will just be hitting the water. Obviously you lose your efficiency. So that's why I don't use a chain. You want something that's going to be able to get all the way up and out of the water. Uh, and obviously on the opposite, when you're floating downstream, like Ken likes to do, which, you know, <laughs> I, obviously it depends on the situation or what you're doing. Some folks, they just can't, 
find anyone to go with. They can't set a shuttle. They're just by themselves or whatever reason. They go upstream a lot. I know Matt Ball fishes a lot of solo adventures real quick, and he goes upstream a good bit, um, you know, a lot of times with this torpedo. But anyway, everyone's situation is different. And floating downstream, I I always use the, the uh, Anchor Wizard with the drag chain on my Kusa or Kusa HD uh, by Jackson Kayak. And so they've got the drag chain shoots. And that's what it's for. It pulls the drag chain back up on the kayak so they're not dangling. So when you're when you want to uh, get the full speed of the kayak, you're not, you know, fighting that chain that's hanging down there. But a lot of times, um, I, I'll just let them dangle and let them act like a keel to keep me straight. But obviously, the the foolproof way to make sure it slows you down and keeps you straight is to have it ticking the bottom at the right depth. So definitely use that a lot going downstream. And again, I'm using it because I want to be stopped in. Sometimes a swifter, not like super swift. You never want to drop a drag chain when it's too swift. If you if you can't back paddle, then you shouldn't drop your drag chain. In case you do get hung, the way you obviously get out is just by back paddling the opposite direction, mm-hmm. back upstream. So anyway, that's kind of the way um, I go downstream, and I want to be in the middle. Sometimes in the middle of the river, in the swifter water, throwing into the slower water, the eddies, the calm stuff on the sides. Yeah. And then the final way uh, on a larger body of water lakes uh ocean flats whatever bigger rivers that are wider and shallow the power pole is really great to have i mean i like that six footer because obviously you still have some trees you want to you don't want that thing the eight footer kind of has a hard time getting under a lot of uh, tree limbs on the bank but if it's a wide open river and it's shallow uh, it's hard to beat uh just the quick double tap of the power pole and it just stops you when you need to get stopped fish a little bit Double tap it up, go downstream, fish again. So definitely had some moments of jealousy when I've seen people using power poles and wondering why I haven't got one yet. But it it uh, it definitely looks it could be super advantageous to have one. Absolutely, there's a right time and the place for it. Again, I don't. I'm sponsored by Power Pole, but I do not use it, and they know that. I mean, it's not something you use in a kayaker. You need to have on there every single time. But you better believe, you know, you're gonna need it in certain situations, and it's gonna give you a big advantage especially uh, lakes, saltwater flats, uh, yeah. any wide rivers, like we said, it's just awesome to have. And if anybody's curious about the drag chains, that's not exactly something that if you can just like go out and buy, at least to my knowledge, or is it like, you, no, you know, but um, one of our buddies, uh, Jeremy Crow, has a really nice article floating around on the internet somewhere of how to do it yourself, make one. Um so if you want to hunt that down, it, it's a pretty good yeah, uh, cool. article about how to make a drag chain so that you guys can get on that if that's something you're interested in doing for yourself. I bet Jeremy Crow wrote that article in in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> He's in Michigan, if, uh, if you guys aren't familiar with Jeremy. So see all the downtime in the winter? Jeremy was out writing articles to help you guys. So yeah. drag chain article, Jeremy Crow, it's they're pretty simple. I mean, 24 inches, 22 inches of logging chain, somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, bike inner tube or gorilla tape to quiet it a little bit. But yeah, he, he does it. He talks about like, like um, having some plastic dip or something. You know, there's there's different yeah, ways to, uh, to soften those up. Nice. Sounds good, man. Well, I think that's pretty much a wrap. We covered a lot of stuff. We uh, did a little learn segment here. And, uh, I'm excited to get on the water, fish a little bit before it gets too cold, and we'll see how these episodes go. So if you're following the social media, I should be posting a little bit, uh, some stories and some photos of our trip, and hopefully we'll catch some fish. And yeah. Have a good time. I'll get back here and, and maybe have some time to fish a little bit more before it gets too cold, and holidays start getting involved. I get up, you know, get up your way again to Ohio, and hey, maybe we can go steelhead fishing again when I get up there for uh Heck yeah, let's do it. And... Uh, who knows, man? We'll, uh, we'll have to see what what the year has in store. But I can't wait. And then we're gonna, definitely going to do this uh, fantasy KBF draft coming up soon. And it's going to be a good, good year, man. I'm pumped. Yep. Hope you guys out there are pumped. And as always, hiking is awesome. I'm hooked on that. <laughs> yeah, I, awesome. I'm going to Susquehanna this weekend, so I'm excited. Hopefully, I can apply some of this knowledge you just dropped, and uh, we'll see what happens. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, well, they'll still be munching top water up there, so. I'm sure until the water, you know, I heard today or yesterday, I was watching Scott Canterbury. Uh, he's the Bassmaster Angler of the Year. He says he throws a buzz bait. It's one of his main three go-to baits he was saying on tour this year. 
to help them win angler of the year. And he was saying he throws it at 52 degrees or higher. I've always thought personally, 60 degrees was kind of my little thing. Yeah. 58, 59 degrees, maybe 58, 59. He, he's confident in it, confident at 52 and up. So I promise you the Susquehanna is not 52 and under. So better uh, get your buzz bait on. Absolutely. Going to try. Good luck, man. Thanks, man. We'll follow you online and, uh, Hopefully you guys will catch some big ones. For sure. All right, guys. We're out of here. Peace out. Tight lines. Smooth rapids.